Well, hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's Word again together. I want to look at uh, the book of Numbers today, try to understand what we find uh, in the book of Numbers. And maybe I thought by way of introducing the book, read one of the central passages that uh, Jesus himself refers to in the New Testament uh, regarding God's uh, mercy on a faithless people uh, from Numbers chapter 21. So if you want to turn with me to the book, to the book of Numbers chapter 21, and we'll read just quickly from verses 4 uh, through 9 and think about that uh, together. So Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of, many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. If a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Um, Well, if we think about the difficulty of reading the book of Leviticus, uh, because it's hard sledding and there's not a lot that immediately might pique our interest in Levitical laws, Uh, The opposite is true when we come to the book of Numbers. It's filled with things that are very interesting to read. Um, The primary purpose of the book of Numbers is to tell the story of Israel's pilgrimage in the wilderness, uh, to really tell the story as they set out from uh, Sinai and head towards the Promised Land, uh, to deal with that that pilgrimage, uh, to talk about what happened to God's people on the way um, as they come to... Uh, the border of Canaan and to the plains of Moab. Um, William Hendrickson, one of, an old uh, commentator on the Bible, puts the, the purpose of Numbers this way. He says, Whereas Leviticus contained the laws which Yahweh gave to Moses at Sinai, Numbers describes the manner in which Yahweh led his people from Sinai to the plains of Moab. The book is full of Christ. It may be called the gospel in the Old Testament as is clear from the outline that we'll look at together. Spiritual lessons for everyday life may be drawn from every chapter. Remember, he goes on to say, that the spirit that the serpent lifted up supplies the key to the interpretation of the whole book. Um, and we'll think about that as we go on. How does that, this, that story we read uh, really open out the key of the whole book? Um, Well, I think it becomes clear if we think about the outline of the book. I'm going to see if I can kind of bring it up for you. Um, The outline of the book of Numbers, really you see that the first nine chapters uh, concern the leaving of, uh, there we go, uh, preparations for leaving Sinai. So those are the first things we read about in the book of Numbers. The second major part is chapters 10 through 21 as they journey from Sinai to the plains of Moab, so just on the border of Canaan. And so that tells a chronological story um, from Sinai to Kadesh, which is one of the regions uh, we have in chapter 13, the mission of the spies that go out and spy out Canaan and the response of God's people and the judgment of God in chapter 14. Uh, From Kadesh to Kadesh again, chapters 15 and 19. uh, That includes, I'm I'm obviously not including everything that's there, but some highlights, uh, the, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in chapter 16. Uh, the story of Aaron's rod budding in chapter 17. Um, and then the third part there from Kadesh to the plains of Moab, you have the sad scene when Moses strikes the rock at Meribah. Uh, we have the death of Aaron in chapter 20, uh, the lifting up of the bronze serpent that we read about in chapter 21. Um, we have the conquest of eastern Palestine, um, the place where some tribes would settle across uh, the promised land. So we have that story. But it tells a theological story as well. And that's what I want you to see in part 2b. What is a theological story that the book of Numbers tells? 
the book of Numbers tells a theological story um, of repeated sin and resulting failure. Uh, that really typifies what God's people do um, in the promised land. They are, they are constantly failing uh, to do what God has called them to do. Um, they're sinning against him and it results in failure and extends even to, uh, even to Moses, um, even to um, him as God's, the leader of God's people when he strikes the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Uh, there, are, there are many failures that God's people encounter uh, on the way, many failures that they fail to, to do, things that they fail to keep, the resulting sin and failure. Uh, but sin and failure is not the, the only story. As we see theologically, uh, what do we see? Not just sin and failure, but God in his grace causes the serpent to be lifted up. Um, and that does change the trajectory of, of the story. What follows this display of grace is blessing and victory over the Midianites on the plain of Moab. Um, we see the story of Balak and Balaam. You remember the, the famous story of Balaam's donkey speaking to him uh, when the angel of the, road, angel of the Lord confronts him in the road. Um, the angel of the Lord appears to Balaam, and Balaam pronounces three oracles of blessing on Israel, even though he's been hired to curse them. Uh, we are reminded of the apostasy that God's people committed with the Baal worship of the Baal of Peor, and the zeal of Phineas in punishing that sin and restoring God's people. And then some other highlights in the book is Joshua is appointed as Moses' successor in uh, chapter 27. Uh, there's a new high priest with uh, one of Aaron's sons, Eliezer. And so we have a new leader in Joshua, a new high priest in Eliezer. We have a holy war against Midian, and the two tribes are able to settle, two and a half tribes settle in the Transjordan, the, the two and a half tribes that are across the Jordan River uh, from the Promised Land. And so that really is the story of, of the book of Numbers, and it recounts, you can see, uh, sin and failure on Israel's part and God and his grace uh, showing grace. And one of the great demonstrations of God's grace is the lifting up of the serpent in the wilderness. Um, the lifting up of the serpent in the wilderness is kind of an interesting thing because God has told them not to make any graven images, and then here he tells them to make a serpent. And it, you could see how people would scratch their heads and say, why... Why would, why would this be the thing that God does? And um, it's an important picture for God's people. Um, it's an important picture for God's people of what Jesus Christ would come to do. Um, Jesus points to this picture of Numbers 21 in his earthly ministry. He does so in John chapter 3. Um, interestingly, he says to the people, uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus points to this story um, of judgment from God and his merciful deliverance. When he had sent this plague of snakes among them as a judgment on their sin and told them, if you look to the bronze serpent, you will live. And Jesus picks that up and, and says, essentially, I'm here to tell you that this is the condition of the world right now. That the world is spiritually dying um, as a result of being bitten by that ancient serpent, the devil. Um, the world is dying on account of their sin. Um, and it's not just the possibility of uh, spiritual death. It's the spiritual death that's already in motion. Like when you've been, been bitten by a poisonous snake. The poison is already working its way through. You're not dead yet, but you're dying if you don't get the help you need. Um, that's why Jesus will say he doesn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world is already condemned in verse 18. It's already spiritually dying. And the sad thing about the world is that it loves its dying. Right? The, he says and goes on to say in John 3 verse 19, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
Um, even when the light comes, if left to themselves, they creep away. Right? That was the sad story of Adam and Eve. Even when God came into the garden, they hid because they were naked and ashamed. Um, but though the world stands condemned, although the poison is coursing through its veins and it's on its way to spiritual death, the blessed news that Jesus Christ brings is that God loves the world and has sent her a Savior. That God has sent a Savior in the world that just as Moses lifted up the serpent and all who looked to the serpent in the wilderness would live, so Christ would be lifted up on the cross so that we who look to him might have eternal life. And again, we see that Jesus is greater than Moses because the life that Jesus gives an eternal life. Uh, despite the earth's wickedness, Jesus testifies that heaven loves earth and has sent his son to save his people. And so the story of numbers is the gospel of the Old Testament. It's the story of sin and the resulting failure of God's people and yet a God who showers his grace upon his people so that they might live and have a future. It's a book that wonderfully promises uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, where he even appears before uh, Balaam in that Old Testament form as the angel, uh, as the angel of the Lord, um, to talk about his purpose to bless when people are determined to curse his people. So the Book of Numbers is a wonderful story. Um, it's filled with sad stories of Israel's failure, uh, sin, and what it does to God's people. But always, it's matched with the grace of God delivering his people um, and lifting them up. And so it's a wonderful picture that shows Christ, it shows the goodness of our God towards his people and should be great encouragement because it's the story of sin and failure on the pilgrimage and we as pilgrims in this world are subject to sin and failure and it's a reminder of the grace of God and that his son has been lifted up so that all of us may look to him and find life in his name. I pray that will be true of all of us and that we'll take great encouragement from the son of God who's been lifted up as a savior of his people. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this book. We thank you for all of the Old Testament truths that it communicates to us about Christ. We thank you that you have lifted him up, that we might look to him and live. Uh, we pray that we might recognize how desperately we need to look to Christ, that we are without him already on the way to spiritual death, and that we might look to him and find life in his name. We thank you for his coming into the world to remind us of your great love for us, that you have sent us a Savior and your Son, um, that whoever looks to him might have life. And so, Lord, we thank you for your grace to us. We confess our sins and the failure that results from our sinfulness, Lord. We pray that you would restore us, that we would come to the light and look to Christ and find life in his name. And so hear our prayers, Lord. Receive our confession. Forgive us our sins and build us up in the faith until we reach that promised land that we are all looking for. Uh, that heavenly home that comes with your Son. May he come quickly. Hear us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.